This week, the Gospel comes to us from the third chapter of the Gospel of John, which begins like this. Now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born from above. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with all those who are born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel and you do not understand? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you do not believe me, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God didn't send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, the world might be saved. Today, I want to think a little bit about three different people, very different from one another, uh, but all of whom were up in years. And the first of those was a woman that was around when I was a little kid. I mean, a very young child. Everything I tell you about her right now is from before I was nine years old, when we moved from the town where she lived. Uh, but Mrs. Warlow was one of those people who had survived from an earlier day. She would not show up at church without a hat and gloves. She had perfect diction and elocution, and I suspect that somebody had taught her how to speak as precisely as she did. She had the same kind of accent that you hear in um, old Catherine Hepburn movies, that, that sort of thing. Um, and it was natural to her. It was real. She was known around town as uh, someone who did the best travelogues you've ever run into. And this is going to sound really, really bizarre in an age when you can just Google any town on the planet and pretty much 
take a tour of it. Uh, but she didn't need that. She would go off on those trips, and when she would come back, she would uh, announce that there would be a presentation about her latest trip, and it would take place in two spots. In the afternoon, it was the matinee that she would do for the, the ladies at the 20th Century Club. And yes, there really is a place by that name. And uh, they would do whatever it is that they did there. And then in the evening, there would be a fundraiser because people would pay money to hear her describe her trips. There would be a fundraiser and people would buy a ticket and there we were at Lansdowne United Methodist Church and uh, Mrs. Worlow had set up her slide projector and she had uh, always some sort of a, a display with a map on it and she had drawn lines on the map showing every place she had visited along the route and then she would just talk about her trip for however long it took. And people absolutely loved this. It was one of those things that became not only a fundraiser, but uh, a special event. Mrs. Worlow had been somewhere, and now she was going to take you there with her. My family took her someplace one time. Where we took her was out to lunch after church one Sunday. And we went to McDonald's. She had never been to McDonald's. The closest thing she had ever seen to anything like it was a horn in hard arts. Google that one if you don't know what I'm talking about. There was one at the corner of Lansdowne Avenue and Baltimore Pike, and it, it was fun. But for her, the McDonald's was even more fun. When we went in there, uh, my family had to act as her tour guide, tell her what to do, point to the menu above the counter, and help her get settled and all of that stuff. And she ordered a filet of fish And it was fun because when she took it out of the bag, uh, she looked at it. She didn't know that it was going to be a sandwich. And she looked around and she asked where the silverware was. And we had to say, um, there's no silverware here. And she suddenly realized Okay, she could handle a sandwich, but she was going to have to eat the French fries with her fingers. And she got this grin on her face, like she was doing something adventurous, something a little bit um, uh, taboo. She could get on a plane and she could go off to Morocco and, and she could travel across North Africa at the drop of, drop of a hat and she had no fear. But eating French fries with your fingers? That was pushing things to the edge. We're coming back to her in just a minute. But first I want to take a look at somebody else that we've already heard about this morning or this afternoon or whenever you happen to be watching this. That somebody was a man named Nicodemus. He lived in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus and he was part of apparently the elite he was a leader of the Jews, John tells us. He was a Pharisee. That just describes his theological stance. 
And he had something in common with Mrs. Worlow, who would be born a couple thousand years later and, and far, far away. That was that he had a sense that the world was full of exciting things. And he saw exciting things and he saw wonders. He saw amazing things happening all around. And he saw that they were happening especially when Jesus showed up and he wanted to know more. How is it that people are being healed? How is it that the deaf are hearing? How is it that the blind are seeing? How is it that the dead are being raised? How is it that people are being reconnected to their communities, forgiven of their sins? How is it that lives are being absolutely turned around? These things are wonders. These things are amazing. These things are signs of the kingdom of God coming close. And he wanted to know about it. But Jesus, getting close to him, was taking a chance. Like eating french fries with your fingers but far more serious. Because you might be embarrassed to eat with your hands, but to get too close to Jesus could get you arrested. So he went to Jesus by night. And that was where he began to ask him those questions, beginning with, being honest about what he was seeing. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God because no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. To which Jesus replied with, I think what was actually meant as a, a compliment being given to Nicodemus by Jesus. Uh, Nicodemus saw the kingdom of God coming around. And Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And that's where things got interesting. Because right there ensued a conversation of the sort that John's gospel presents quite often whether Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman at a well and she's having to draw water and he says, I can give you living springs that will spring up to life inside you. And she says, no, slow down here. Let me get this straight. And they talk about her life. They talk about... Um, how many men she's been with and that the one that she's with right now um, is not her husband. Like I say, there's a, a lot going on here. And there's a lot going on in people's lives and Jesus doesn't shy away from it, but he uses the things that are going on to point to what can go on. And he does this also for Nicodemus. Nicodemus asks these questions that come from a misunderstood word. See, the, the word for from above in Greek, anothen, is also the word for again. So Jesus says, hey, buddy, you are born from above. And Nicodemus says, how can anybody be born again? Can you go back where you came from? And start again when you're old. That's how we know that Nicodemus thought of himself as old. 
It doesn't say his age in the Bible, except to say that he was a leader. So that probably implied it, but that's how he thought of himself, certainly. And he thought that, how can you be born again when you're my age? How can you start over when you have passed your prime? But Jesus says to him, okay, you want to misunderstand the born from above and go into born again, and I'll go with it. And he goes with a little bit of wordplay so that he can get through to Nicodemus, who wasn't understanding the first time around. He talks about the wind, which is from above. He says, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What's born of the spirit is spirit. So he, he goes with this whole birth thing that Nicodemus has, has introduced into the discussion. But he adds to it. Do not be astonished, I said to you, you must be born from above, born again. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes from, and you don't know where it's going. So it is with everyone who's born of the Spirit, born from above, born again. Nicodemus, he says, don't overthink this. Don't be so sure that you can ever explain everything. And why are you here except to find an explanation? Or is that really why you're here? You're already educated. You're already one of the leaders. You're already one of the teachers. So you should understand this. Why are you asking a question unless you want the answer? If you already have the answer, why are you here? Sometimes Nicodemus, sometimes you have to just grab for the french fries and shove them in your mouth. Have some sense of vibrancy. Live. Jesus' presence in the world is like that. It's like that very first spring day, to keep up with the, the wind imagery here. Jesus' presence in the world is like that first spring day when you suddenly decide, you know what, it's about time I opened up a window today. After months and months of being inside, you open up that window and the air comes just pouring in and you didn't even realize until that air starts flowing around the room just how stuffy things have become since you closed everything down for the winter. And boy, isn't there a smell and, and a feel, an edge to the air that you've just been missing. And you can't put your finger on it. But when it's there, you know it. And God's Spirit gives us that kind of renewal, that kind of birth, that kind of new beginning, that kind of feeling from above, that kind of fresh air 
that blows into our souls by Jesus' grace and refreshes everything. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. And that life isn't only life after death. It's a kind of life that begins here and begins now, and yes, carries over. But you can live while you're alive. And even better, it's only the start. Nicodemus left that meeting with Jesus. And he left with the window cracked open a little bit. He had a lot more to ponder and to think about. And we get two glimpses in John's gospel after this of, of how things went with him. We don't get a long description but in the first glimpse, there are people who are trying to figure out how to arrest Jesus in the temple. And it's Nicodemus who stands up for him and says, you can't arrest somebody if you can't say he's done anything wrong. That took guts. And you know what took even more guts is the next time that he appears in John's gospel, which is after Jesus has been crucified. And while Jesus' dead body is still hanging on the cross, Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, takes the body down and gives Jesus a decent burial. He didn't realize how temporary it would be, but it had to be done. And boy, did that take courage. Courage that doesn't seem to have been there in him the first day that they met, the night that they met, because he went under cover of darkness. I told you I'd talk about three people up in age. So let me tell you about the third older person. I'm thinking about a retired preacher that I knew up in Allentown. Somebody who had led a very full life. At the start of World War II, Bob had enlisted as a chaplain, feeling that it was his duty to be there with his countrymen. And he didn't stop at just signing up. He went into the Marines. And he was assigned to a unit that was sent to the South Pacific. He fought, well, he served. He served the people who were fighting. He gave them comfort as they died, talked to them about eternal life, assured them of God's love in places where love is not a word that was being used. He saw to the wounds that were not visible. 
and some of them that were. He came through that battle of Saipan. This weekend, we remember how many people did not come through any of that. It's Memorial Day tomorrow. Remember them. And all the people like them. But Bob did come home. And when he got home, he wanted so badly to have a nice, peaceful life after that. And for the most part, he did. He was assigned 24 years later to one of the most placid places that you can possibly imagine. 1968, he found himself in the tiny little village upstate New York, the village of Woodstock. Well, there went the quiet. And there went the sleepiness. And the stories he told about the ensuing week are, are really just absolutely tremendous, and some of them quite hilarious. And there was a certain joy that he found that stayed with him years later when he was telling me about that particular week. But he told me one other thing that I would share with you. And that goes along with Mrs. Worlow's experience. It goes along with Nicodemus' experience. Bob once said to me that when someone would ask him if he had been born again, Bob would say, you know, every day, Every single day, I have that blessed opportunity to be born again. And every day that I take it, I give thanks. I give thanks to the Lord for this life and the life to come. That was his story. It could be many people's, at least the conclusion of it. As for me, I'm not old yet. I, I look forward to it. But when I grow up, I want to be at least a little bit like each of those three people. We'll see. But every day, there's an opportunity. Amen.